Review. Oh, oh, come on, that's not. Oh no, that's. Come on, that's. <sighs> Fine. So today we're talking about twenty muscle building myths that you possibly still believe. And to make things interesting, I thought I would tell the grain of truth, the morsel of truthiness that all of these myths have, because almost every single myth does have that little piece of truth to it. The first is that muscle damage is what causes muscle growth. So it's the idea like, oh, I go in and I, I rip the muscle off the bone and then my body repairs it with the muscle protein that I eat and then I get bigger muscles, muscles, yeah. Well, not necessarily, okay? The grain of truth here is that the training that is required to trigger muscle growth, muscle protein synthesis, often is accompanied by damage. So training the eccentric lengthening part of a muscle contraction is a large part of what causes muscle growth. And this can cause damage. Also training close to failure, training with muscles that naturally give a, a stretching type of effect, these cause damage, but they're also very potent causes of muscle growth. And it's best to view damage as a byproduct of training, not the goal. If you see an Olympic sprinter and they tear their hamstring, they're not gonna get any muscle growth from that, okay? And so muscle growth, is caused by training which causes damage but it's not the damage that actually causes the growth it's just a side effect the second myth is that volume is the main driver of hypertrophy now i'm not saying volume is not important it is certainly a factor that you should factor in to your training however i would say that progressive tension overload is going to be more important than your overall volume you can do endless sets but if you're not getting stronger over time and you're not adding weight to the bar you probably won't see very robust gains if you look at the research on volume yes often more volume is better but that's because every other factor is fixed because it's a scientific study and they want to isolate one variable plus a lot of people are not training very hard and they're not really training close to failure Therefore, yeah, doing more volume is going to be better. And it appears that volume is going to be the prime driver of hypertrophy. If every set is a warm up, yeah, it's true. But if not, it's probably not the biggest factor. It's just one factor of many. And don't expect to do tons of volume and get huge off of that. Number three, soreness is necessary for muscle growth or is a good thing. Now, I've been guilty of this in the past. You know, you get sore after a hard workout and it's like you've earned that soreness. And You know, it seems like it's correlated with muscle growth because again, similar to damage, the things that cause soreness, in the gym at least, often are correlated with muscle growth. However, again, soreness is an unwanted byproduct of that hard training. It's not the soreness that is actually causing the muscle growth. And you can grow very well if you never get sore, or you can get really sore and not grow. If you run a downhill marathon, your legs, your calves, your anterior tibialis are gonna get super, super sore but you're not gonna see any meaningful growth from that. It's just too much and it's not really actually triggering muscle growth. It's just beating you up. And you can use soreness to actually gauge if you've done too much or too little, but just because you're not getting sore doesn't mean you're not growing muscle. And just because you're not sore doesn't mean the workout was a waste or was not effective. Number four, protein timing. Now the grain of truth is that protein is important and you do need protein to trigger muscle protein synthesis and to gain muscle. Otherwise you just have nothing to actually build the muscle with. Please sir, I want some more. However, you don't have to have protein right after your workout, okay? This anabolic window thing where it's like, you need to eat within 30 minutes, you have to have protein right away. You see people, literally, I've seen people drink their protein shake in the gym. They take their protein shake with them to the gym. That is just not necessary whatsoever. If you wait an hour, if you wait even two hours, it's not really that big a deal. Number five, muscle converts to fat. So this is the idea that if you stop training, the muscle, it just, it just changes to fat. Muscle is muscle, fat is fat. If Dude, we've been through this, okay? I'm cultivating mass. Stop saying that. You are not cultivating mass. And if you are, stop cultivating and start harvesting. If you stop training, yes, your muscle will get smaller. It will atrophy. 
And yes, you might put on fat if you stop training, especially if you don't watch your diet and you keep eating a lot of food. You see these guys, these athletes like Michael Phelps, who, you know, they were eating 10,000 calories a day and they were burning it all off, burning, right? And then they stopped training and they just got fat. Well, it wasn't the muscle converting to fat. It was the muscle shrinking, them eating too much and putting on fat from the energy of the food they were eating. Muscle actually doesn't have very much energy in it. It's just water and protein. And therefore, it's not really going to be providing enough energy when it atrophies to actually make you fat. And the grain of truth is that if you stop training, yeah, your muscle is going to get smaller and you're going to gain fat. But it's not actually the muscle converting to fat. Number six is that you can get too muscular. Now, you certainly can get too muscular, and aesthetics is a personal choice. Not everyone wants to look like a bodybuilder, even a natural bodybuilder. But the idea, especially a lot of women think this, is that you're going to get big really, really quickly. Like, you just touch a weight and boom, like, oh my, ho, oh, boom, like I just blew up. No, okay, that's not what happens. Especially if you're a woman, putting on muscle for the most part is an uphill battle and very, very slow. It takes a long time. And guess what? If you find that you're getting too muscular for your own tastes, stop lifting. It's the easiest thing in the world. It's what people do around the world every single day. They just, they just don't lift. Easy as pie. Number seven, fast and slow twitch muscles. Now, this is obviously a real thing. Uh, it's absolutely based in physiology, but a lot of people try to use this to inform training decisions. They say, oh, I'm fast switch, so I should only do you know, three reps per set, or I'm slow twitch, I should only do 15 reps per set. In reality, it's not that black and white, and most people are pretty much average. Plus, it varies based on the actual muscle. So if you're a marathoner, yeah, maybe you have quads and hamstrings that are slow twitch, but that doesn't mean that other muscles might not be fast twitch. Plus, it doesn't really change training all that much, unless you are a complete genetic outlier. Most people, it's going to be in the middle. Plus, a lot of methods that people use to test if they're fast or slow twitch just don't hold up. If you can do a certain number of reps with 80% of your one rep max, some people might use that to say they're more fast or slow twitch. But actually, this has very little correlation to an actual muscle biopsy to check the area. So it's just not really something you can actually test without a muscle biopsy, nor is it particularly useful to actually decide what to do in the gym. Number eight, rep ranges. So you think, okay, one to five reps is for strength, uh, five to 10 is for size, and then 10 plus is endurance, or, or 15 plus is endurance, you know, five to 15, eight to 12 is the hypertrophy rep range. In reality, it's not that black and white. Yes, strength is going to be most productively trained in the one to five rep range, but a lot of powerlifters train with slightly higher reps or even a lot higher reps. And just because you're an endurance athlete, that doesn't mean you should only train with higher reps to replicate your sport because it's sport specific. If anything, an endurance athlete wants to do lower reps so that they don't get the interference effect because they're already good at reps. So you want to train heavy in order to get a novel and new stimulus. Seems like I'm always thanking you for something. <clears throat> what are you doing? Uh, we we don't do that here. As for size, you can grow on pretty much any rep range. Sure, five plus is going to be more effective than one to four, one to five reps, but you can still grow on low reps. Similarly, higher reps also have issues, but you can still grow on sets of 15, 20, even 30 reps. It has been shown by science. Now, the grain of truth is that, yeah, strength is going to make the most sense in the sort of one to five rep range, size five to 15 or so, and then endurance, yeah, you're going to want to do higher reps. But there's a lot more overlap than most people think. So I would say overall, this is still mostly a myth. Number nine is that you must fail. And the logic is that if you don't fail, your body has no reason to grow. So if you're doing a curl and you keep, oh my God, one rep in reserve, your body's going to be like, nah nah, we're not, we're not going to grow. We're like, we're just, it wasn't quite enough, bro. Like if you had that extra rep, like, okay, we'll grow. But, but nah, nah, like that ain't me. This is definitely false. I think most people should train closer to failure than they usually do. Just walking around commercial gyms. Most people are probably five, 10 reps or more away from failure. And it's been shown that getting closer to failure is generally a good thing for hypertrophy, but you don't need to actually fail. In fact, you don't even need to go to zero reps in reserve. Okay, you can keep one, two, three reps in the tank and grow very, very well. But you should be fairly close. Number 10, muscle weighs more than fat. Uh, they both weigh the same. I mean, muscle is denser than fat. It takes up less space, but a pound of muscle and a pound of fat, they both weigh, they both weigh a pound.
Right. They're both a kilogram. Oh, no, no, you and all. What is it you don't get? <laughs> I'm joking. Are you all right? I don't get it. It's all right. I don't worry about it. If you made it to the end of the video, if you have that good of an attention span, you will definitely enjoy my book. It's currently $15, and I'm happy to plug this product. And I will keep plugging this product because it's my own product, it's my own video, it's helping a lot of people, it's very reasonably priced, and I work my ass off on this book. So, grab it if you want it, it's going to be a great resource in your journey. Alright, that's all for today. Like, subscribe, turn on those notifications, all that good stuff, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.